So 32 years ago, and that's within my lifetime and probably many of yours, scientists discovered for the first ever time planets outside of the solar system. Now, if you've been around for a while, you might remember the very first video I ever made on this channel was about these types of planets, which are called exoplanets. Note that I will be using the word planets in this video, but I mean it in a colloquial sense, because technically planet only refers to the eight planets of the solar system. Now, these first two exoplanets were pretty weird, being in orbit around a neutron star and all. But then 29 years ago, scientists discovered the first planets around other stars that were like the sun. Now, this was a really big deal. They actually kind of got a Nobel Prize for it, which like, Sorry to the guys that found the pulsar planets. <laughs> now this planet, 51 Pegasus b, was also very weird because it's a gas giant planet like Jupiter, but it was orbiting closer to its star than Mercury orbits to the sun. Weird. We actually know of a lot of these now and they're called hot Jupiters. <laughs> so new exoplanet discoveries continue to come in over the years more and more, indicating that exoplanets are actually pretty common. And then eight years ago, and this was certainly within your lifetime, and if it wasn't, dear gods, where are your parents? We found a planet orbiting Alpha Centauri c. Now, if that name doesn't sound familiar to you, you might know this star by its other name, Proxima Centauri. Proxima as in close. Yes, that's right. The star that is the closest to the sun in the entire universe has planets. How fucking cool is that? Exoplanets right next door, just over four light years away. Wait, wait, wait. Exoplanets as in plural? So there have been three exoplanets found in the Proxima Centauri system, one of which has been confirmed and two of which are still candidates. I just want to pause for a moment and appreciate how absolutely mind-boggling this is. 32 years ago, we didn't know if planets and other solar systems existed at all. And now we know that there are multiple planets in the nearest star system to the sun. You can see why I chose to study exoplanets for my PhD. Okay, so let's talk about this star. Now I said its name was Alpha Centauri C, and that might hint to you that there is an Alpha Centauri A and B, and you would be correct. This is a triple star system. Alpha Centauri A and B are the big boys in this system. They're pretty similar to the sun, and they orbit pretty close to one another at a semi-major axis of around 23 AU. Alpha Centauri C, on the other hand, is kind of just over here doing its own thing, because it orbits the other two at a semi-major axis of around 8,500. AU. And this kind of separation between the close binary and the wide binary component is how this three-body system can stay stable. Proxima is also just a small star. It's only about 12% the mass of the sun, making it a kind of star called an M-dwarf. Its surface temperature is only around 3000 Kelvin, which is a little bit more than half the surface temperature of the sun. And while it is hot enough to melt things like niobium and molybdenum, it's not hot enough to melt tungsten. Like you could put my husband's wedding ring in the atmosphere of this star and it wouldn't melt. So as far as the surface of a star goes, that's pretty chilly. Bring a coat. <laughs> okay, so that's the star, Proxima Centauri. What about the planets? Let's go in reverse order. So the way that exoplanets are designated is that they get a letter, a lowercase letter, based on the order of discovery, starting with the letter B. Since there are three of them, that means we're gonna be going D, C, B. In this case, Proxima Centauri D is actually the innermost planet, orbiting at a distance of just 0.03 AU. That's really close. I mean, Mercury orbits the sun at just under 0.4 AU. Now I said the letter D indicates that this was the most recent discovery, and indeed Proxen D was only proposed as a planet candidate back in 2022, based on data that was taken in 2020. And one reason that it was so hard to find this planet, even though it's really close to the star, which generally makes it easier, is because this planet is so freaking small. It's about a quarter the mass of the Earth. They use the radial velocity technique to discover this planet, which basically looks at how much the star is moving because of the orbit of the planet. As you can imagine, a planet a quarter the mass of the Earth does not make a star move very much, even if that star is a pretty small star like Proxen. In fact, the signal for this is about 40 centimeters per second. Now maybe that doesn't mean anything to you, but I promise that this is a really, really difficult measurement to make. In order to find this signal, they had to use a very, very high resolution spectrometer called Espresso that was mounted on the VLT. Yes, that's the very large telescope. No, I did not come up with this name. This signal is so small that at the time, Proxima Centauri d was the least massive planet ever discovered by the radial velocity technique. And I think it still holds that title, actually. Now, even though Proxima Centauri is pretty cold for a star, this planet is orbiting so close that it's really hot. Its equilibrium temperature is possibly around 360 Kelvin, which is 188 degrees Fahrenheit. For context, the equilibrium temperature of the Earth is about zero degrees Fahrenheit. Proxen d is toasty, for sure. So yeah, it's pretty cool that we were even able to detect this hot little exoplanet neighbor. <laughs> so if you know your alphabet, before D comes C. And Proxima Centauri C was proposed as a candidate back in 2020. 
a pandemic planet. <laughs> now this is actually the outermost of the three planets and it orbits at a distance of around one and a half AU, which is basically how far Mars orbits from the sun. Now Proxima Centauri C was also detected by the radial velocity technique. And since it's so much further out in the system, you might expect that it's a much bigger planet and you would be correct. The mass is estimated to be somewhere around seven times the mass of the Earth. Now there are no planets like this in the solar system, but this kind of medium sized super Earth or mini Neptune planet is actually really common among exoplanets. Now the signal for Proxim C was detected by a different high resolution spectrograph called HARPS, which is kind of a previous generation, so it's not quite as high resolution as Espresso. And HARPS is mounted not on the 8.2 meter VLT, but on the 3.6 meter telescope at the La Silla Observatory. But these are both ESO telescopes, so that means both Proxim D and Proxim C are ESO discoveries. Now something in astronomy that I think is just so cool is called pre-covery. So this basically means that once you detect something, you go back and you find it in older data that's pre-existing data from before the discovery, but you didn't know it was there until you new to look for it, if that makes sense. So a couple astronomers did this for Proxen C and went back and looked at Hubble data from the 90s and thought that they might have found an astrometry signal that was corresponding with Proxen C. Now because Proxima Centauri C is so far from Proxima Centauri, it's actually a pretty good candidate for what we call direct imaging, that is being able to see the planet directly instead of only seeing its effect on its star. So in 2020, a group of astronomers looked for this direct visual evidence of Proxima Centauri C and they found something? <laughs> Basically there was some signal there that could have lined up with the Proxima Centauri C, but it wasn't a clear detection and they couldn't really confirm it. And then in 2022, after the discovery of Proxen D, some astronomers came up with a new algorithm for evaluating this radial velocity data. And they went back to the HARPS data and they used it for Proxima Centauri. And they were able to see that signal from Proxen D, but they didn't see the signal for Proxen C. And the RV signal of Proxen C should be larger than that of Proxen D. So they disputed the existence of Proxima Centauri C and said that the initial detection was probably just unaccounted for systematic effects. And as far as I know, that is still where things currently stand with Proxima Centauri C. It is a planet candidate that has been disputed, but has not been confirmed or rejected. So after D and C, we come to B. In the case of Proxima Centauri B, we were saving the best for last. See, Proxima B is the middle planet. And while Proxima D is real hot and Proxima C is real cold, Proxima B is just right. <laughs> Yes, Proxima Centauri b is located in what's called the habitable zone or sometimes called the Goldilocks zone, where basically conditions are just right for liquid surface to exist on the surface of a planet. It's really important to note here that being in the habitable zone does not mean that a planet definitely has liquid water on the surface. And even if it does, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily habitable or that it has life on it. It's basically just a minimum qualification for life as we know it, necessary but not sufficient. For a teeny little star like Proxima Centauri, that means that the habitable zone for an Earth-like planet is, just eyeballing it here, about 0.04 to 0.09 AU. That's really close. And Proxen B, it orbits at 0.049 AU, so it is right squarely in the middle of that habitable zone, baby. It's actually a little bit further out in its habitable zone than Earth is in the sun's habitable zone, so its equilibrium temperature is a little bit colder, about negative 38 degrees Fahrenheit or 230 something K. But if that estimate of the habitable zone is for Earth-like planets, how Earth-like is Proxen B. I mean, we have Proxen D, which is so tiny that even if it wasn't super hot and it was in the habitable zone, it's so small it might not be able to hold on to any water. I mean, just look at Mars. And then Proxen B is actually big enough that it might not even be a rocky planet. It might be more like Neptune with this really, really thick atmosphere. Without a radius measurement, we can't really know for sure. But Proxima Centauri B? it is within just a few percent of the mass of the Earth. Now we don't know its radius, but at that mass, it is most likely to be a rocky planet. So, oh my gosh, one of the three nearest exoplanets to us in all of the galaxy is an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone of its star. I know I already used the word mind-boggling, but I really can't think of another word. It's just, it's mind-boggling, it's so amazing. But before you get carried away thinking about little green men running all around this planet that's just a little over four light years away, there are a few more factors that are important to consider. So I said that the habitable zone around an M dwarf star like Proxima Centauri is really close to the star. And that means that the planets that are orbiting in that zone are likely to be tidally locked to the star. This is like how the moon is with the Earth, where the same face of the moon is always facing the Earth, but in this case, it would be the same face of the planet always facing the star. Now, it's not impossible that tidally locked planets are habitable, but it's a pretty big difference from how the Earth operates. The one side that's facing the star is gonna be getting just so much more energy. It's gonna be way hotter than the other side. Have you ever sat by a fire on a cold night and your face feels like it might just melt off, but your back is freezing? It's like that. For some tidally locked planets, that might mean that the star side is just way too hot and the other side is just way too cold, but there might be life around the Terminator or that kind of in-between permanent twilight area. 
Now for proxen B, because it's further out in the system, it's a little bit colder. So instead of being this like unbearably cold, unbearably hot dynamic, it might be an ice ball, but the side that's facing the star has melted a little bit. So that actually might be where the liquid water is on the planet. We don't know for sure. There are a lot of factors that go into modeling the climate of a planet, and we just don't have enough information about Proxen B to do this with accuracy. But there are some proposed models that would have a habitable area on the planet. Now, another thing that's really nice for habitability is an atmosphere, and not just for breathing, although, you know, we do like to do that. <laughs> See, the boiling point of water is very dependent on pressure, and the pressure on a surface of a planet usually comes from the atmosphere. So without enough atmosphere to provide pressure, the water on the surface of a planet can just boil away. Well, technically it would be sublimating away, but that doesn't really have the same ring to it. <laughs> Another nice thing about the atmosphere is this little feature you may have heard of called the ozone layer. Here on Earth, the ozone layer actually protects us from some of the harmful radiation coming from the sun in the form of UV rays. UV light is not kind to self. But on the other hand, the atmosphere can be kind of not cool for life. I mean, think of Venus. It's got a nice thick atmosphere. A little too thick, if you know what I mean. And do we know anything about the atmosphere in Prox NB? No, we do not. So this is a big unknown. And that's just the planet. There's also these stars. So I've talked a lot about how Proxima Centauri is really small and it has this really low flux. But that's not the only way that M dwarf stars are different. M dwarf stars tend to be really, really flary. Stellar flares are these really big bursts of concentrated radiation, and M dwarf stars just flare a lot more than G dwarf stars like the sun. And the radiation in flares is really high energy, like those UV rays that are so harmful to humans, and even extreme ultraviolet rays called XUV. And since the habitable zone is so close to the star, there's a lot less distance for that radiation to dissipate over, because radiation kind of dissipates on this inverse square law, so a little change of difference makes a really big difference in how much radiation you're getting. So these planets that are in the habitable zone of M dwarf stars are just getting blasted by radiation, like a lot. And it's not just the radiation, because these stellar winds, which is like charged particles and stuff, is also really, really strong. So all this UV radiation and the stellar winds, this can cause a planet to lose its atmosphere and even its water. And if that radiation is getting down to the surface, it could basically just be like sanitizing the surface of any life. And how much of that reaches the surface can depend a lot on whether or not Proxima B has a magnetosphere. And we, again, don't know this. But then again, maybe it's not all bad. And if the planet does have an atmosphere and a magnetosphere, all that XUV flux can actually help create ozone, which could create an ozone layer in that atmosphere, which could help protect its surface. Basically, as you can probably tell from how much I've been talking about it over the past five to 10 minutes, habitability is really, really complicated. And for M dwarf stars, it's even more complicated because they're just so different from solar-like systems. And we have no idea about life in non-solar-like systems. We have a one single sample and it's around a G dwarf, not an M dwarf. So is Proxima Centauri B habitable? Does it have liquid water? Does it have an atmosphere? We do not know any of this. As you can imagine, Proxima Centauri B is of really high interest to scientists, so it's going to be continued to be observed by ever more powerful telescopes. It's even being monitored for techno signatures, because we really want to learn as much as we can about this Earth next door and answer some of these open questions we have about it. Now, one last but definitely not least thing to consider is that while Proxima Centauri is really, really close to us, astronomically speaking, four and some light years is really, really far in practical terms. Consider the Voyager missions, which are basically some of the fastest spacecraft that humans have ever launched. They're borrowing about 17,000 meters per second, which is like 0.0006% the speed of light, I think. It's slow, cosmically speaking. <laughs> They've actually both entered the interstellar medium and are over 100 AU away from the sun. But even so, well, for one thing, neither of them are headed towards Alpha Centauri. But even if they were, it would take them over like 73,000 years to get there. And that's assuming that Proxima Centauri wasn't moving in the meantime. In actuality, Proxima Centauri and the sun are moving relative to one another, so it wouldn't even, it just wouldn't happen. <laughs> but just to illustrate the current distance with some context, it's very far. Over the decades, there have been several mission ideas proposed to visit Alpha Centauri, even before we knew about these exoplanets around Proxima Centauri, but they're all basically science fiction. They're just not feasible with our current level of technology. Probably the most realistic proposal is called Breakthrough Starshot, which seeks to use a swarm of really, really low mass probes that are propelled by light sails to fly by Proxima Centauri. If you have powerful lasers, like really powerful gigawatt lasers, shining directly onto these light sails, you could potentially accelerate them up to about 20% the speed of light, which would make the trip only last, you know, a few decades. And luckily, sending the data back, information can travel at the speed of light, so that would only take another four years once they managed to fly by. So yeah, even with the most wildly optimistic, pie-in-the-sky dreaming idea, we are not going to be able to visit our neighbors anytime soon. But even so, it is just so damn exciting that we have exoplanets so close to us, especially one that is potentially habitable. I just honestly feel so lucky to be alive at a time that we can know these kind of things, and I really look forward to all the future information we're going to learn about the exoplanets next door. <laughs>